If you haven't done so yet, pause the video and try to answer the question on your own before listening on. In the diagram, it's going to be useful to call the velocity of the locom locomotive VL and the velocity of the high-speed train VT. Now, it's worth noting that for the locomotive, the acceleration is zero. The locomotive doesn't really realize that the train is coming, so it never hits the brakes and therefore continues at the same constant velocity that we have called VL. And the reason that's important is because if we look at the following equation for displacement, we would see that, again, because the acceleration is equal to zero meters per second squared for the locomotive, that this term would actually drop out. And so what that means is that the displacement of the locomotive is equal to its initial velocity, which we have called VL, multiplied by the time t. And so what we're going to do is show the locomotive moving forward a little bit, and the displacement that it moves forward with will be this quantity right here, v sub l times t. And so we've pushed the locomotive up a little bit, and again, we've marked the displacement that it travels v sub l times t. Now, while the locomotive is moving forward, this high-speed train is actually gaining on it, and we're trying to avoid a collision here. So eventually the high-speed train is going to catch up with the locomotive. You might draw it roughly up here. So this is the high-speed train. And the key idea is that if a collision is to be just avoided, that means that the final velocity of the high-speed train has to equal the velocity of the locomotive. And so that's going to also be a key idea. And again, the reason why the final velocity of the high-speed train has to equal the velocity of the locomotive is because we're trying to barely avoid this collision. If indeed the velocity of the train were larger than the locomotive, it would actually collide with it. And if the velocity was much less than the locomotive, then there would be no collision whatsoever. It wouldn't even be close. We're trying to just avoid the collision, and therefore the final velocity of the train has to equal the velocity of the locomotive. Now, let's talk more about this high-speed train. We can refer to the following equation from kinematics. We have the displacement of the train equaling essentially the average velocity multiplied by the time. Now, it's going to turn out to be convenient to divide both sides of this equation by the time t. And so if we do that, the left side will be delta x over t. These t's will cancel out. And basically on the right side, we're left with v naught plus v divided by 2. Now, let's not forget that the total displacement of the train is going to include the displacement marked by d as well as the displacement marked v sub l times t. Remember that the high-speed train has to travel the entire length of this track and catch up, so to speak, with the locomotive. So for the displacement right here of the train, we're going to be filling in d plus v sub l times t. And this will be all divided by t. On the other side, we have the initial velocity of the high-speed train, which we called vt. And then we have the final velocity, which we recall was equal to the velocity of the locomotive. We had determined that earlier in the problem. So we'll write in v sub l here. This is all divided by 2. Now, on the left side, we can actually algebraically simplify it. We can divide it into two fractions. We'll have d over t plus v sub l times t all divided by t, but those t's will actually cancel out. So we can actually just leave it as this. Now, this is all very good so far, but the problem is it doesn't include acceleration, and that's indeed what we're trying to find in part a. Let's turn to this equation from kinematics. And what we'll do is actually solve this equation for the time t. And so to do that, we can subtract v naught from both sides of the equation and then divide both sides by the acceleration a. So we come up with this expression for time. And the reason that that's nice is because it includes the acceleration. We're going to substitute that expression for time into the equation developed earlier. Now we're going to try to algebraically solve for the acceleration, and then we'll be set to plug in the known values. Now we have a whole number divided by a fraction, and so to simplify that, we can actually multiply by the reciprocal. So for example, we would have d multiplied 
by the reciprocal. So that's the acceleration over the change in velocity, essentially. So we'll rewrite that term in this manner here. Why don't we go ahead and subtract the VL over to the right side. If we wish, we can find a common denominator over here. This is right now over 1. Let's multiply the numerator and denominator by 2. And then with the common denominator, we can combine those terms. So we're going to have VT plus VL minus 2VL all divided by 2. Of course, we have like terms here. VL minus 2VL is just going to be a minus 1VL. Still trying to solve for A, let's divide both sides of the equation by D so that on this side it'll cancel, and on this side it'll end up in the denominator. And then finally, we can solve for A by multiplying both sides of the equation by V minus V naught. Now that's going to cancel on the left-hand side, and therefore we have acceleration isolated. Let's come back to here and remember that the final velocity, which is V, is going to be the velocity of the locomotive. So why don't we come in here and actually replace the final velocity with VL. And then the initial velocity is just the velocity of the train, which is VT. Now this term right here in the numerator and this term right here are almost the same, but we can do a little algebraic trick to make them exactly the same. We can multiply the numerator here by negative 1 as well as the denominator. So this will become negative. And the reason that's neat is because that's going to distribute and this will become negative VT, and when we distribute here, it'll become positive VL. So this becomes positive VL, and this is negative VT. Negative VT plus VL is the same thing, of course, as VL minus VT. So actually, we have this term multiplied by its identical counterpart. That's going to leave us with VL minus VT squared, and this will be all divided by negative 2D. We can now plug in the known values. We have the velocity of the locomotive given to us in kilometers per hour, the velocity of the train, and then also the displacement d is given. Now that's given in meters, whereas the speeds are given in kilometers. So what we could do is change the 676 meters into 0.676 kilometers. So we're just moving that decimal place over three places to the left. So now we'll go ahead and plug in. And this turns out to be roughly negative 12,888. Now the units here are going to be kilometers per hour squared. We probably need that in meters per second squared. So we'll do some conversion factors here. We know, of course, that one kilometer is 1,000 meters. And then we know one hour is 3,600 seconds. Be careful here, you're going to have to square that conversion factor so that the hours squared will cancel with hours squared. So now you can type that into your calculator. Don't forget to square this conversion factor. And you end up with roughly negative 0.994 meters per second squared. The question wanted the magnitude of this constant deceleration. So if we take the absolute value of that result, we're going to end up with 0.994. 994 meters per second squared. So this would be the final answer, finally, to part A. Now for part B, to sketch a graph for the situation in which a collision is just avoided, we've shown one possible sketch here. This top line, which has a nice straight line to it, is the locomotive, which was moving at a constant velocity. And then the more curved line is the high-speed train, which we'll just call HST. The reason that the high-speed train has a curved line is because it is decelerating. Briefly, recall that the slope of a position versus time graph will give you the velocity. The locomotive has a constant slope and therefore a constant velocity, just like we said earlier in the problem. The slope of the high-speed train is actually decreasing. So it's very steep right here. It kind of flattens out a little there, flattens some more, flattens some more, and it continues to flatten out. So the slope is decreasing, and therefore the velocity is decreasing, which makes sense because it was slowing down. So this would be the sketch for the collision being just avoided. If the collision was not avoided, we would have essentially the same graph, except the high-speed train would have a little bit of a steeper slope to it. And so, unfortunately, because of that steeper slope, it would be moving at a higher velocity and that would actually result in a collision right about here.
Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, please click the thumbs up and subscribe. And don't forget that you can send in your own question to the email address shown on the screen, and I'll do my best to post the answer to it on YouTube.